Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual panel discussion brought to you by San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders. My name is Stacey Kidd, District 5 Regional Director and session host representing the National Office of the American College of Healthcare Executives. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items to help you navigate the program in our virtual environment. For the purposes of noise control, your lines will be muted for the duration of the session unless there is active discussion, at which point you may unmute yourself to talk. You can also submit your questions through the chat function. Today's session is worth 1.5 hours of ACHE face-to-face -face education credit. Credit will be applied to your account approximately two weeks following the end of the session based on your live session attendance. This session is being recorded and will be available within 48 hours by navigating to your My ACHE account and selecting My Online Learning. Now to begin the session, I will turn it over to Johan Otter. Good afternoon, my name is Johan Otter. I'm currently one of the co-presidents of the San Diego and Imperial County Organization of Healthcare Leaders together with Dasha Dadu and Daryl Atkin. Next slide, please. On behalf of the three of us and my annual conference co-chair, Peter Chu, and um, Crystal Buey, which is one of our volunteers par excellence, welcome to the third and last panel of our virtual annual conference titled COVID-19 on the front lines. Next slide, please. Um, before we get started, a word of appreciation to our sponsors. We have 13 sponsors. Um, they help us be able to forward our mission of educating the healthcare leaders of today and tomorrow. So thank you very much sponsors for uh, sticking with us through this uh, very challenging 2020. Next slide, please. Um, all session recordings will be made available on our YouTube channel if attendees want to rewatch or share with others who missed the live sessions um, and want to watch it anyway for um, qualified education credits. Uh, the sessions are, as you can tell, the keynote address, it's done by Dr. Young. I hope you can um, listen to that. It's, it's a very important keynote address, and it has to do with the health disparities and bias in medicine. As you know, 2020 has been an interesting year, to say the least, and all the protests around um, racial injustice and COVID had to be addressed during this conference. And we did that with our keynote address and our three face-to-face -face sessions. Um, you heard two weeks ago from four of our executive leaders in the San Diego and Imperial counties. You heard last week around crisis management with four other leaders from public health, um, the armed forces, and our laboratory medicine. And today you'll hear from those on the front lines. Next slide, please. Um, our speakers are donating their, um, their speaker fee in a way to several of these um, great organizations that we have in town. And I just wanna say thank you to our speakers to donate to these great organizations that help current individuals that are struggling with the COVID-19 situation. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm here to um, introduce Dr. Ghazala Shabir. Um, Dr. Ghazala Sharif was named Chief Medical Officer, Clinical Excellence and Experience at Scripps Health um, only months before everyone knew what COVID-19 was. Actually, this was baptism by fire by her, and she's done a fantastic job. She co-led our command center at Scripps Health and immediately provided medical leadership for Scripps 15,000 employees and 3,000 physicians. In addition, Dr. Sharif worked closely with county public health and facilitated regular meetings with the region's other chief medical officers to better manage COVID-19 as a community. Now, Dr. Sharif earned her medical degree from Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine, completed her residency in emergency medicine at Stanford University and a fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine at Rabies Children's Hospital. She received her Physician Executive Masters of Business Administration degree at the University of Knoxville at Tennessee. Board certified in both emergency medicine and pediatric emergency medicine, Dr. Sharif previously served as Division Director of the Emergency Department at Radies Children's Hospital before moving to Scripps Health, where she served as Chief Experience Officer and as Scripps Medical Director of Quality and Medical Management. That's good enough. So, 
I know I got a little bit more for you because you are quite an accomplished person because besides you work with local healthcare organizations, um, Dr. Shabib has also served on several national committees. She's a published author with two books, books on emergency medicine and numerous articles to her name and is a recognized lecturer on pediatric emergency medicine, patient experience, conflict management and team building. Now I have the good fortune of working directly with Dr. Sharif. I consider her a great friend and I know her as a true advocate of quality patient care and experience. She's therefore an excellent person to moderate this panel, COVID-19 on the front lines. So without further ado, Dr. Sharif. All right, well, that was, we can go to the next slide, but that was quite an introduction and, and thank you, Johan. Um, yes, I call it my uh, CMO hazing as soon as I stepped in basically COVID hit, but I've had an opportunity to work with so many of you across our, our region and it's been a privilege and honor to do so. And so I was very excited when Johan asked me if I wanted to facilitate this session because it truly is about uh, our front lines. And so we have quite a range for you. Uh, first up, we have uh, Katie Moss, who is literally on the front lines. Uh, she's a critical care nurse, has been with UCSD uh, for, for eight years. Her unit was, I think, one of the first IC unit, units uh, to step up and become a COVID unit. So she'll tell us more about what that looks like, uh, especially with no visitors and, and things like that. I think it's a time for us to remind our community of what it's like to be in the intensive care unit when you really cannot have any visitors and uh, look to you for some words, words of wisdom really for those out there who really are not complying with, it, with any of the, of the rules and that we get so many things saying this, this is a hoax. I think hearing from you directly will kind of put that into perspective. Um, I know it's probably heartbreaking for you to hear those rumblings out there when you know night and day that this is not a hoax out there with COVID. So I really look forward to, to hearing more about uh, your experiences firsthand. And then we have uh, Jeff Gearing, who's a senior, senior vice president of support services and planning for family health centers of San Diego. He has one of the, I think you're 10th of the largest federally qualified health centers in the nation. So that's quite a big job uh, for, that you have, Jeff, and I appreciate you taking out uh, the time today. Jeff's been very busy, even in the prep session we had, uh, fielding phone calls, so I know how busy he is and, and really providing care to our underserved. Um, he got bonus points today because I heard he spent some time in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where I, where I grew up from the age of 11 and I went to University of Michigan there, so he, he got some extra points today for that. And last but not least, we have Lou Kenny. She's our chief clinical officer in El Centro, Regional Medical Center. Lou has been in the heart of a lot of the work in Imperial County. I know that uh, Lou um, has been in close coordination actually with the other hospital in Imperial County Pioneers uh, because you are seeing uh, once again, unfortunately, the brunt of uh, COVID coming back up again and what that's really like, at least in San Diego, where we have the I guess the just really the luxury of having you know close relationships and you know within, within each other we can transfer patients, but really that coordination that you've had to do uh, from from Imperial County and all the barriers the first time around that you had to endure I think it would be very helpful for for this group to hear about as we go into our, we're in our next phase. Frankly, we haven't yet seen the results of Thanksgiving yet. We're just now getting into that. Uh, ICU capacity here is very tight, which is why we're on the watch list again. And so we're trying to do some creative things with scheduling and staffing. And so it'd be great to hear from you what adjustments you've had to make so that we can learn from you and really start implementing those changes today as well. So before we get into presentations, I, I wanted you to know our panelists just from a little personal side as well. So I asked these guys to share one thing that, that people may not know about, about them. My one thing is I took drum lessons as my midlife crisis. And I told these guys, my husband said he wished I just bought a car. It would have been way quieter and he would have had, he would have had less headaches. But that, that's my one thing that people, that I don't really advertise because I don't want to play drums for any of you unless you want to want to leave. But uh, Katie, what, one thing you want to tell us about yourself that people may not know. Um, so actually last year I went to Africa. I went on three safaris and we went great white shark diving and we canoed with hippos and crocodiles. It was quite an adventure. Wow. So you didn't share that when we asked her earlier, she told me she's getting a cat this weekend. Where did that come from out of the blue? That's quite, that's wow. I'm going to uh, talk to you about that afterwards. I would love to, to do a safari uh, when we're allowed to travel. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. Jeff? Uh, so we're all coping with COVID different ways. Um, this Friday, I'm driving to get a new Airedale puppy um, really for to get me through the pandemic. So that's uh, one thing that uh, probably that. no one on the call knows about. <laughs> no, and that's really you know good for you for doing something different, right? And, and adding some excitement into your, your busy days. So that's a good one. And then Lou, Lou had a very exciting one for us that we did not expect. <laughs> 
Um, I'm originally from Wisconsin, and so when in Wisconsin, you got to do when you're in Wisconsin. I bought a Harley, a fat boy, and I'm only five foot two, so it was fun, it was dangerous, it was adventurous. Uh, so that was my little weird thing that I did, and it was the anniversary bike, you know, so it was very special. Yeah, no, I thought we just got a kick out of that one. So, so what I'm going to do is hand off um, to our, our colleagues. They're going to go a hand off to each other. I will monitor the chat box. So if you can write in any questions that you have, if it's for Katie, please write could Katie, you know, so that I know who it's for. If it's just a general question, go ahead and write those in as well. And, and I'll, I'll uh, get that going right after our folks do their presentation. So we're going to hold the questions until each of them can talk and we'll do the questions at the end. So without any further ado uh, here, Katie, would love to go ahead and have your presentation and get us kicked off. And the rest of us are going to go on stop video so you can just see Katie. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Katie Moss, a critical care nurse at UC San Diego Health. I have worked at UCSD as an ICU nurse since 2012. In March of this year, my unit became the designated COVID ICU. So today I'm here to share a little different perspective, a little about my organization, but also a little about my personal experiences on the front lines. Next slide. We received some of the earliest patients. On February 5th, two planes with 232 evacuees from Wuhan, China landed in San Diego. 13 individuals developed symptoms. Six patients were cared for at UCSD. Two of these patients tested positive. This experience served to be invaluable and made us strongly consider how we would manage an Italian or New York style expansion of critically ill patients. We underwent careful analysis of how we should respond as a health system in, in terms of surge planning. UCSD recognized the need for a coordinated response, so we activated the Incident Command Center, or ICC. The commitment of ICC participants was extensive. They accepted patients, sent early samples to the CDC, determined PPE policies and other COVID-related policies, they visited occupied um, patient rooms to monitor negative pressure and evaluate PPE doffing within the layout of the room. We have both a hospital and an ambulatory incident command center and literally all the day-to-day -day operational issues get managed through the ICC. Then on March 13th, when the economy shut down, we stopped elective surgeries, not because we couldn't safely perform surgeries, but it was a resource allocation issue. We were afraid that we would have an enormous amount of COVID patients in the hospital. And if we were doing elective surgeries, we were going to be filling the wards and our laboratory and x-ray and staffing capabilities with our routine patients. So that shutdown was really about resource preservation of the inpatient side. Next slide. So to speak to the surge uh, planning crisis, uh, crisis expansion planning for UCSD, we were thinking, what if we went to 100 COVID ICU patients or 200 or even 300? So we planned it all the way to our ventilator capacity of over 300 critically ill patients, which is what we thought was at the top end of what we could safely do. That involved recruiting other physicians to help including a volunteer network of our physicians who are not currently critical care physicians, but who have prior critical care training. A similar process happened on the hospitalist services. There were a lot of volunteers, and if we would have gotten there, and we still might, they would have received critical care training and been ready to care for a surge of critically ill patients with COVID-19. This expansion plan expands out to the entire healthcare team, including nurses, respiratory therapists, laboratory services, et cetera. They all have a very similar plan, starting with volunteers who have critical care experience than those who are eager to step up to the plate, learn critical care, and be involved in the care of these patients. Surge planning and require, uh, has required um, planning with equipment, PPE, and staffing. We also have designated areas in our emergency rooms for respiratory illness and non-respiratory illness to try and reassure patients that they can continue to get emergency care and will not be exposed to COVID-19. We set up ER tents and a different path of travel for respiratory illness patients. Fast forward to May and June, we started to realize that California's mitigation strategies were working to soften the curve, and it looked like, at least in San Diego, we were not going to be overwhelmed with a surge of critically ill patients. We, at that time, were averaging 50 to 60 per day with 30 in the critical care units. 
we felt we had the capacity to handle that. So we decided that we were able to provide the remainder of the healthcare that the community needed, such as cancer care, cardiovascular care, and surgical procedures. Next slide. Testing is something we are particularly proud of. We recognize that testing was going to be critical. We have seven different types of testing platforms, including the most common PCR platform, Roche. We bought an additional one and we expanded our capabilities. We were one of the first health systems to be doing more than 300 tests per day in California. We set up drive up testing and tried to make that easy for everyone. And we also had a results team. In the beginning, all positive and all negative results used to get a phone call within 24 hours from the results team. Now we only call the positive within 24 hours and we post negative results on UCSD's MyChart. We were resulting an average of 2,500 tests per day as of October 30th, but that number is higher now as UCSD is actually testing all staff every seven days and additionally as needed. We're also responsible for testing the returning undergraduates. We're testing school districts. We're helping San Diego County respond to the testing needs of our senior and memory centers, as well as nursing homes. UCSD has been listening to the, uh, where the needs are and we have, when we have the resources, we've been trying to provide that. We've done it without worrying about the costs. We're trying to record how much we're spending on these things, but we don't ask for reimbursement before we act. This is a pandemic and we simply assess the needs of the community and respond to it. And secondarily, we'll think about cost and cost recovery. We did receive CARES Act funding, which has definitely helped, um, but it has not completely covered uh, any COVID related expenses. Next slide. The other thing unique about UCSD is that we didn't allow the therapeutics to be ad hoc. We had requests for remdesivir back in June. We had a bunch of requests for hydro, uh, excuse me, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, but we did not prescribe any medicines outside of a clinical trial. So we said, let's get our infectious disease teams together and put a therapeutics committee together. They're going to review the world's literature and they'll tell us what is ready for administration and what is um, experimental. So now we have a therapeutics committee that's led by Dr. Chip Schooley, who's an international expert in infectious disease. They meet bi-weekly to review treatment best practices and publish guidelines for COVID treatment. We also have a COVID-19 clinical trials committee led by Dr. Constance Benson. They review clinical trials related to COVID prior to IRB submission, ensuring there's no overlap in enrollment in important clinical trials that are open at UCSD. We have opened a total of 18 different clinical trials, seven of which are ongoing today. We also have a vaccine group led by Dr. Susan Little, and we participated in the three largest national vaccine trials. So we only provided care that we knew had justifiable evidence that we would be confident to provide. We participated in the remdesivir trial, so we would give it through a clinical trial and not ad hoc. Then when remdesivir was approved, we gave remdesivir to everybody who met that criteria. Same with serum, same with hydroxychloroquine, same with IL-6 inhibitors. When high dose steroids were approved, that week we changed our practice and everybody got high dose steroids. So we participated in these clinical trials, but again, we did not give off label use for these therapeutics. Same with antibiotics. Antibiotic stewardship is a huge part of the care of COVID patients. We do our best to check for every kind of co-infection, and when we're sure there isn't one, we discontinue the use of antibiotics. These are, in my opinion, examples of when having an academic medical center within a community provides real value. After all, the survival rate in my ICU is actually 73.3%. We have put our clinical care plans online for other systems to see. We provided telehealth critical care to El Centro, and we reached out to our critical care faculty and nurses to, um, to the two hospitals in Tijuana. We sent them down there. We have tried to lead the region in our response, and I feel we've provided a lot of value. As of August, 88 of our patients were transfers from other facilities. Next slide. We recognize that we didn't fully understand the risk to caregivers in the beginning, and we were seeing a number of caregivers, especially in Italy, get seriously infected and even die in the early phase of the pandemic. There was a lot of anxiety and fear around that for ourselves and for our team members. 
the extensive testing, the PPE recommendations, and the observation of the very low infectious risk in the hospital has given us increasing confidence as the pandemic has gone along in the safety of our staff. If possible, we took staff who fit into the high risk categories out of the workplace, allowing for telemedicine and work from home. UCSD wants to be prepared in case anything like this happens again. So we're tracking things such as PPE, medications, blood, ventilators, et cetera, all through a Tableau dashboard platform. They show up as either green, yellow, or red, indicated whether, indicating whether or not we can continue our current use of activity. For full transparency, these get sent out daily to everyone within the organization. We're looking at our mass, consum mass consumption on a daily basis. When our critical care unit admission increase, the PPE utilization also accelerates. A single COVID patient in the ICU con consumes an enormous amount of PPE. I know for me in the ICU, we had to request that our trash be taken out two extra times per day. We have a goal of always having 60 days on hand, which is how we stay in the green on our dashboards. UCSD is also tracking our staffing, and we also have a float team for both ambulatory and inpatient staffing needs. Some of the staff has been redeployed, for example, to the COVID drive up testing sites. We are more aligned and more engaged in the importance of what we're doing now more so than ever. We're also communicating more now than we ever did in the past. Our CEO, Patty Mason, is doing town halls, which started out weekly, then went to biweekly, then monthly, and now they're back to weekly because it's picking up again. And it's probably gonna continue that way. Dr. Chris Kane is also providing physician updates and UCSD did a series of grand rounds, which are available on YouTube. There are also countywide calls and other discussions on a weekly basis between all the CEOs and all the CMOs. Telehealth has ramped up very quickly and has only continued to improve. It's been very beneficial for both our providers and our patients. Next slide. Here is a photo of our telemedicine coverage in, uh, to El Centro Regional Medical Center. This was a photo in the Wall Street Journal and an expose on the care being provided to the patients in El Centro. If you look closely at the reflection in the glass of the patient's room, you'll see Dr. Ramnath, one of our critical care physicians providing telemedicine to this patient. It's a great image depicting how telemedicine is working behind the scenes to take care of patients right now. And I think it's something that will be here to stay. Next slide. When a patient comes to the ICU with COVID-19, first and foremost, this is a respiratory disease that requires expert mechanical ventilation management, which our Division of Pulmonary Critical Care has provided. One of the things we focus on when patients come to our ICU is the supportive care. What separates an average ICU from an exemplary ICU is how well we do the little things. COVID positive patients typically stay in the ICU on average longer than other critically ill patients. So it's very important to avoid the things that can get these patients into trouble, such as hospital acquired infections and skin breakdown. In addition, COVID patients in the ICU on average are much sicker than most of our non COVID critically ill patients. Not only are these patients critically ill with COVID, but they also have other co infections that only complicate matters. We spend the majority of our day trying to rule out other possible co-infections that they came in with and trying to prevent new ones from being acquired. Our patients are requiring very high settings on mechanical ventilation with the addition of pronation therapy and still don't have great blood gas levels. And again, we're doing all of this covered in head to toe PPE. Here's a photo of my staff pr proning a COVID positive patient, which as you can see is very labor intensive. Pronation therapy requires on average four nurses on either side of the patient and a respiratory therapist at the head of the bed assisting with rotating the patient's head and securing the endotracheal tube. In addition, this often happens twice a day, so it's using a lot of staff resources and a lot of PPE. Every day there seems to be changes in the latest data and research, so it's required a lot of flexibility. We're, doing, we're also doing um, several clinical trials on my unit. We used to come in and it would just be about work. Now when we come into work, it's about PPE so that we don't infect ourselves, we don't infect others, and so that we don't spread this disease. Next slide. Every shift I've had since the beginning of the pandemic has been with COVID patients. Nurses are spending hours within six feet of patients known to have COVID disease. 
We do this every day and we have been doing this every day since March. When we go home, we have no doubt in our mind whether we've interacted with someone with COVID. We did, we know we did. There is much more uncertainty coming home and it's a much more controlled welcome home. We're not rushing into the arms of our loved ones when we get home. My husband knows he's not allowed to touch me until I've changed and washed up. In the beginning, he was actually meeting me out in our garage where I would take off my clothes. He'd hold out a trash bag for me to gently place them in because I didn't know much about COVID and I didn't know what I was introducing into our home. Now, luckily, UCSD is providing the COVID, the COVID units hospital scrubs. So we change into them upon our arrival and change out of them before we leave. They never leave the hospital and we're not bringing any of that home anymore. My husband and I did discuss living in separate rooms in the beginning, but ultimately decided that we were in this together and we were going to be until we had more information that would inform us otherwise. That support has really made it possible for me to stay strong mentally and continue fighting this disease every day at work, especially with many of our other coping mechanisms closed, such as gyms, yoga studios, massage, things like that. So right now, the love and support from our families, our friends, and our communities really means the world to us. Next slide. I have been tested on average every single month, if not more, partly for clinical trials and partly from UCSD offering testing to their employees, especially for us in the COVID units. I know that each time I get that negative result and knowing how much time I've spent in these rooms with patients known to have COVID, it's really made me feel more comfortable. That transition for me coming home through the garage now isn't as intense because I feel a sense of comfort. Sometimes I actually think I'm safer because I know that there's someone in front of me with COVID, but I also know that I have the PPE to keep me safe. And these continued negative tests prove to me that the PPE is working. I was definitely more frightened in April than I am today because I know the PPE works. And I know this from my personal experience and the testing UCSD has provided for its employees. Next slide. In the beginning nationwide, the visitor policy was there are no visitors. This was a whole new world for us. We had to work through policies and talk to different stakeholders in order to create something that made sense for us at the time. It wasn't perfect in the beginning and it still isn't perfect and it still changes all the time. But believe it or not, we actually have the most liberal uh, visitor policy compared to other hospital policies I've seen. This has been really hard on us as nurses because we're trying to bridge that gap and be the support system for both families over the telephone throughout the day and our patients by holding their hands, reassuring them that they are safe and we're doing everything we can to take care of them, updating them that their loved one has called and we try to pass along at any messages. We do FaceTime calls, we do anything that we can. Um, Either way, we make an effort to reach out to families every day. And during end of life and extreme circumstances, we do everything we can to get families there at the bedside, COVID or not. Next slide. We as healthcare providers get no breaks from COVID. We come to work and it's all about COVID. We come home and we're reminded of COVID because certain things are closed, have modified hours or a modified way of providing their services. I know how extremely hard it is to continue to deal and cope with COVID. Every time I see something on the news or social media where there's a large gathering of some, time, some, some kind, I get very nervous because I've seen a trend since March that approximately two weeks later, our COVID admission rates increase. I've often joked that if I hear the term hang in there one more time, I'm going to lose it because honestly, I know how difficult it is to attempt to hang in there. But if we all stick together, follow the guidelines and wear masks, practice proper hand, hand hygiene and try to limit our contact with others, I know we can kick this sooner than later. This photo is actually on my unit and you can look out and see the cruise ship, which has lots of people on it um, in the very beginning. So again, just another image depicting how we don't really get a break from COVID. We see it all the time. So I wanna thank you all for listening to me. And at this point, I wanna hand it over to Jeff. Thank you very much. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, let's see, here's my slide. So um, let's get started. Uh, this is a hard act to follow, Katie. Wonderful job, wonderful job. Um, so it's been a difficult year for everyone. Um, and the response to COVID's dynamic, it's changed rapidly. In fact, some of my slides uh, that were done last month 
have have changed, um, have evolved and with the the new um, the new developments that are very significant. So, you know, these include since this PowerPoint was done a month ago, is Thanksgiving happened? Uh, we had a we've had a significant surge in cases. The ICU beds have um, largely filled up in, in San Diego, and um, um, the um, the not, uh, we've descended into the purple zone. Pfizer has obtained FDA approval on uh, the vaccines to, to be distributed this week and has been shipped to um, San Diego. So all within the last couple of weeks. Uh, next slide, a little bit about family health centers. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, we're um, a very large um, FQHC, a federally qualified health clinic. Um, these are some of the services we provide. Uh, we see uh, either through encounters or uh, medical visits, mental health visits, over 200 thousand individuals in San Diego County every year. Um, some of the things I want to just highlight um, that will come back in the presentation is we have 23 medical clinics largely in low income areas of San Diego County. We have a significant commitment to the homeless population and have a very large homeless um, outreach and case management program. Um, a very large outpatient behavior health program uh, with the largest mental health provider in terms of uh, patient seeing uh, in the county. Um, on an outpatient basis. And then we have a high complexity lab, which is a little bit different for a community clinic. Uh, next slide. These are just some of the pictures of our clinics. Uh, the, the three on the top are our medical clinic, some of our larger medical clinics. The one in the middle is our downtown connections clinic, which is tied with connection housing. Um, we have a large call center that's in the bottom left, a mobile medical unit. And then on the right is our um, behavior health center in Hillcrest, um, which is a large substance abuse and mental health treatment uh, program with HIV case management. Uh, next slide. So in the early days, we had a, a lot of confusion, anxiety. Um, you remember the PPE shortages and um, our CEO was out in the community basically uh, trying to scrounge PPE. We're, relying on uh, um, PPE coming from China in some cases, um, just whatever it takes to keep the employees safe. Uh, we started with daily uh, uh, check-in calls with our command center that we stood up and then it went to every other day, then once a week. And then we've now gone to more frequent um, command center calls because the situation is worse than in the last month. Uh, we've had um, developed protocols largely based on CDC guidance and county public health guidance on protecting staff and testing and who should be tested. And if you are if you think you're positive or have symptoms, how long you should be out. Um, a lot of staff anxiety too, um, which is attenuated, but still um, is still there with, uh, um, if a coworker uh, is out, why they're out. Um, if someone tests positive, trying to calm staff down and manage the situation. So um, just a lot of ups and downs and um, a lot of also looking at who, who's doing what in the community, who's allowing who to work from home and what positions and how does it work. Obviously our, our employees talk. And so managing those expectations, um, understanding where um, individuals are getting their information and then also changing with and adapting as needed as well. Next slide. So this is a county, some of you have probably seen this before. It's the County of San Diego dashboard. It's, it's um, and obviously it's, it's dated. This isn't the current information, but I just do want, want to do a shout out to the county. Um, they're huge, huge demand in many different ways in the county um, to, to step up. And we've seen um, Dr. Wooten, you know, be the voice of um, public health for the county and provide guidance and uh, come up under a lot of uh, pressure and criticism for um, shutdown orders, um, but really looking, you know, always drawn on the data, on the science of the data and the science to really drive changes. And, you know, epidemiology has been a huge, um, uh, important critical function of this. And we've seen this directly um, on looking at the data um, and then also providing us guidance. So we've remained very close um, and tied in with the county um, in many different ways, but uh, they continue to monitor and provide guidance uh, throughout the whole pandemic and continue to do so. Uh, next slide. So this was in the early days. Um, this is at the convention center. We had uh, uh, Alpha Project, BVSD, um, and then Father Joe's all had cohorts down at the convention center and they're still there. 
um, over a thousand homeless um, individuals. Uh, we um, stepped forward and, and um, did testing at the uh, at the beginning. We tested all the VVSD and the Alpha Project um, clients that wanted to. Uh, one of the struggles was, um, do you mandate or not mandate getting testing? Um, and so that was a um, you know a struggle debate. Um, I think. Uh, you know, at the time it was it was optional. If, I mean, in some cases, there was only 50% of the individuals wanting to get tested. Um, you know, I think things have evolved since then. But um, again, that's it, it has some ethics involved with it, um, as far as you know, mandating someone to get tested for public health reasons. Uh, but we uh, we then sent all those the specimens to our high complexity lab, and then had turnaround times um, the next day. Um, and so there was a lot of attention on who was positive and who wasn't. Uh, although all the ones we tested, which was, I think about close to 700, we only had two positives at the time. So uh, the positivity rate was very low, at least initially with the homeless population. Um, with, with our own staff, um, I mean, our own uh, um, patients, we have um, COVID case management, and that means offering case management to someone that is COVID positive. Um, do they have trouble getting food? Do they have trouble um, paying rent? And do, can they benefit from case management to help manage that situation? So um, that's something we've strived to continue um, because those that it's not just um, the health issues, it's all the social issues as well that, that you deal with, it, particularly if you're isolated and alone and you're COVID positive. Obviously you can't go to the grocery store if you're actively have COVID. So how do you, how do you remain food secure? Um, we pivoted very quickly on mental health. Um, we went to um, telephonic and televideo within two weeks. Um, and at the time we were seeing uh, about 3000 patients a week for mental health services. And we've maintained that through the pandemic and actually increased services during the pandemic and opened two mental health clinics um, at the end of the summer. So we continue to expand mental health services even during the pandemic. Um, dental has been a real challenge. Um, it's, um, you know, you're, you're providing dental services. There's an aerosolization of um, obviously um, particulates in the, in the mouth. And so how do you uh, maintain a safe dental environment? So we've had to scale back much of our dental services um, and then gradually bringing it, um, it back with various ways of air purification um, or um, um, uh, infection control measures for reducing um, the risk of, of, again, providing dental care in a, in a dental clinic with multiple patients. So again, our dental services have, are still there for low income, but they're greatly curtailed from what they were. Next, sir, next slide. Um, I mentioned this earlier, the employee relation challenges have been significant, and I know you all have probably seen the same thing. Um, it's uh, you know it's someone who it, did to get positive they, uh, at the in, at work or was a community acquired. Our experience has been most of the most of those pay, uh, employees that are tested positive are it's community acquired as opposed to getting it at work. Um, as things evolve, we become more strict. Um, you know, not allow employees to eat together in a shared break room, have them eat in um, outside or in a car in the car whenever possible. Um, I'm not going to go into all the specifics of this because you're seeing the same thing, but also managing the situation when uh, a, a close environment like a call center has an employee test positive, how to manage the other employees that are coming into the same work environment um, and manage their anxiety um, and being empathetic to the stresses and um, situation they're going through as well. Um, there's always employees looking at who's doing what in the, in the community. So um, comparing uh, our work, workplace policies with, with others and other healthcare providers, particularly in the community, to make sure that um, we're, we can justify the, the decisions we're making and the policies um, that we're implementing um, regarding the pandemic. Uh, so we've, we've, like you all, I'm sure have experienced had a, a spike in unscheduled PTO and personal leaves of absences. And, you know, it's one of these situations that when someone calls in with COVID, it's usually, it's, it's um, is it they 
they tested positive, which you know usually um, that's a definite. They think they're positive because they've had been exposed, um, and and so that if they've been exposed, we have them stay home, or they are symptomatic. And that that last one is interesting uh, case because um, you know employee are they really symptomatic or are they just hypersensitive? Um, and then you have uh, individuals too that are um, can game the system as well by saying they have a sore throat and know that that's we're going to tell them to stay home. Uh, but obviously, uh, with abundance of caution. And so, are they really sick or or not? So we've had cases where we've had significant call outs, and particularly since Thanksgiving too. Um, and obviously, it's it's on the honor system. Um, but you're trying to sustain operations with significant um, call out rates, which can you know be again one third of your staff at certain locations and so managing that has been a major challenge for us as it is as it has been for most of all of you as well um, we did do um, uh, some layoffs at the beginning in the spring when things look very um, uh, 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 difficult um, obviously we rebounded fairly quickly um, and so many of those staff were offered the ability to come back um, but um, we did have to adjust in the spring when uh, just to make sure that um, we could weather the storm. Um, we've had uh, a number of staff go out on, on, on telework arrangements. Again, we look at productivity. Can we measure productivity when someone goes out uh, is approved for a telework arrangement? Um, some positions are well suited for that. Other ones, it's a challenge. Um, I've heard, um, I've seen success stories on this. I've also seen where telework has really caused um, issues with uh, sustaining operations by having staff work at home. So it's it's being smart about when and how you approve telework arrangements. But we've offered our staff uh, food bank and gro grocery assistants um, that are struggling. Uh, we started actually a child care center um, at two of our sites to uh, to help support those uh, employees that are parents and don't have can't make other arrangements um, for uh, their children. So that's a real interesting dynamic with the schools, um, you know, being closed largely for in-person um, classroom training and parents being um, having to make a decision on uh, do they um, ask for a leave of absence, do they quit, you know, or do they try to work and, and find other alternatives for their kids at home who are in school. Um, so it's, it's, a uh, it's, um, again, we've offered, uh, two cohorts of uh, daycare services for um, those under five and then uh, uh, five to nine um, at two different locations that help our employees are really struggling with that situation. Uh, next slide. Um, so we have, uh, we implemented this summer uh, four large testing sites and this is a flyer we use. It's uh, our Chula Vista Diamond, Grossmont and Logan Heights. These are, uh, all different neighborhoods all tend to be um, lower income and the, the prevalence rate of um, COVID is, is fairly high in these areas. Um, last week, we had a, a record number of specimens. We, wrote, we pushed through our uh, high complexity lab, 542 specimens. Uh, the positivity rate for that day was um, 29%, which is much higher than the county. I think the county the same time period was around 9%. So um, it's not just we're testing individuals just because or the word well, there's actually a lot of um, individuals that um, are positive that are coming to our sites to validate that they are indeed sick with COVID. Um, we've we started a registry for all those that tested positive um, to manage follow-up to see if uh, follow them if they get admitted to the hospital and once they're discharged to continue to follow them in our clinics. Uh, we have, um, everyone who comes to our sites is also screened for depression. So this gets into the mental health impacts of COVID. Um, if they screen positive uh, for depression with the PHQ screen, um, we have a therapist contact them the next day to talk to them about their mental health status and to see if they, are, um, if they would benefit from uh, therapy services and mental health services with us. So that's something that we implemented midstream in the, in the summer that we've been able to sustain that I think is, um, again, another aspect of the pandemic we really um, have tried to focus on and, and support. Uh, next slide. So I put this slide up here because it's this COVID's not a, a, a typical disaster. And if you all um, 
have gone through joint commission or have training in, in um, emergency management and disaster preparedness. These are the four cycles of emergency management. And you know, usually uh, you prepare for um, a disaster, put in uh, measures, um, then there's a the disaster happens. There's an earthquake or a fire or a flood or a tornado. Um, and then there's a response um, to that, that event. And then you recover and then you learn from um, the event, you mitigate um, um, your plans and strengthen your plans to mitigate um, uh, weaknesses from reoccurring the next time a similar event occurs. So we've been really stuck in this response phase, um, which is interesting and it's challenging. And that's probably you know, part of the COVID fatigue is, um, you know, we're, we're almost, what is it, 10 months plus into a disaster that's just continued and there's really no quick end in sight. Um, you know, it's gonna go into next year, obviously, and for a period of time next year. So the responses period is, is this during section is, is um, you know, wears people out um, and uh, is much different than normal, a normal disaster. And so I think being conscious of the impact of uh, COVID fatigue on everyone um, whether you're inpatient care or supporting patient care is, is significant um, and how to recharge um, and um, um, re sustain your efforts over a long period of time is more important than ever in this type of disaster. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is another county report. So I'm, I'm on um, the All Hazards Health Services Capacity Group, and you can see all the individuals that sectors that present. Um, and this is once a week or once every other week depends. It's got it's it, it sometimes it's been every week when things are bad and and, and then it's gone to every other week. But um, there's reports out just all across the community and monitoring of how things are from you know the ER e, um, the ERs that are in diversion, admission rates, uh, ICU capacity, positivity. Um, but you can see all the different functions that that really. Um, make the village, I guess, that, that uh, are part of the response to a pandemic. Um, and it's obviously it's, it's public health, it's medical, but then, you know, EMS, the, the Sheriff's Office, County F San Diego Fire, military medicine, the VA community clinics, um, the SNFs are very important, particularly with this type of pandemic, um, and the medical society, what's going on at the border. Uh, it's just um, all coming from a different angle to, to help, um, create a full picture and a full response to the pandemic. So, um, and then also Hospital Association is a big player in this as well. Um, and they represent collectively um, the interest and needs of the hospital and bring those forward to the county. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about mental health, I've touched on it a couple um, times, but um, these are just some uh, information that uh, the impact of uh, uh, COVID on individuals or patients. And it really can be over time that we're despair, a sense of despair and, and deficit of hope. And uh, this week's been hopeful because we have a vaccine coming, but um, even with that, you, you know, you look at the news repeatedly and the, the high death rates and it's, um, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's trying, it's very trying. So one in five um, Californians usually experience a mental health illness in a given year. Um, NAMI is projecting it's one in three, NAMI International or NAMI National. Um, so the prevalence of mental illness is, is, is increased significantly. Um, it's particularly trying for seniors that are isolated. AARP um, found that 50% of those 50 or, and over felt less motivated. Um, the fentanyl overdoses in San Diego County are double what they were. Actually, this is triple, um, that was as of July, it's at least double. If double, if not close to triple, what they were for the same time uh, in 2019. Um, there, there's been a reduction in uh, residential treatment beds in San Diego County because of um, staffing. It's been a real challenge, and of those beds, 90% are occupied. Um, so it's it's getting the word out, getting people motivated that treatment is a possibility, um, but then also making sure the um, the beds are staffed. So obviously, there's a need, but but staffing up the programs to meet the need is, is another challenge. And then the other third component of this is getting uh, patients motivated 
that are struggling with either mental illness or addiction issues to get seek out treatment. And then with, with employees, there's a, there's a real significant, uh, significant issue with um, burnout. 78% of physicians survey report feel burned out. Um, the burnout among healthcare professionals is really, um, it, it, it's not just the providers, but it's everyone, everyone in the hospital, the nurses, and in the clinics, and are just part of the healthcare system is really feeling a sense of burnout. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's um, the COVID fatigue, whether you're with direct patient care or providing support to those who provide direct patient care, it really is a trying on the whole healthcare system. Next slide. And this is um, my last slide, and it's somewhat dated. Um, it's Operation Warp C, which we've all heard of, and with uh, Pfizer and Moderna listed as the uh, Pfizer um, uh, vaccine being distributed now, and then Moderna hopefully will be later this month. Um, just just um, a, a sense, I just checked in the John Hopkins uh, website um, yesterday, and, and so we're up to 16 million um, positive cases, and that's almost um, twice as much as the next com company, um, co country, India, which has 9.8 million, which is, um, you know, which, which is, uh, I don't know what to make of that. Um, it, you know, um, certainly I, I'm not sure why um, the pandemic spread so, um, um, you know, prevalent through the country, our country, and why um, it's, it's more so than the next country in line, India. Um, and it could be multifaceted with one of them, our, our reporting systems are much better. But the deaths, you know, we're gonna break 300,000 deaths um, today, which is really um, distressing. But we continue to plug away and um, we continue to um, work on treatments and vaccines and testing to and manage this public health crisis as a team and partnering with everyone in the community that's part of the solution. So I will stop there and I will turn over to uh, Lou Kinney and you can take it from there. Good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Lou Kenny. I'm the chief clinical officer, chief nursing officer at El Centro Regional Medical Center. El Centro, Regional, El Centro is located about 12 miles from the Mexican border. Um, and we're a tiny little hospital that had um, was served quite a bit of challenges through the first wave. So we're the little medical center that could, and we did it, and we continue to do it. Uh, it's going through this, you know, the, through the second wave. Next slide. So we did build a model, and, and as all models, there's some flaw to it, um, and, and some will be useful. And I hope that our model will help other hospitals um, take a look at how they are planning. And hopefully, we don't have a third wave, but um, if we do, they can see what we've done. Next slide. So we're just going to talk about how we built our um, plan and our story and that how plans can uh, be everything and, and can be nothing. I'm going to talk about who has helped us out, how do we got engaged with the, the nation and how social media has helped us. Next slide. So uh, end of November, uh, of November, we took a look at our positivity rate uh, when we were asked to do this uh, presentation. And it still was pretty high, 28%. Um, then I looked at it at December 2nd. It was creeping up a little bit. As I looked at it on Friday, we are now at about 34, 35% positivity rate. Uh, today, I didn't get a chance to look at it, but our numbers uh, went up significantly over the weekend. So we are still uh, experiencing the Thanksgiving aftermath. Next slide. So here's what we did and how we started looking at our timeline. Um, when we heard you know, that uh, COVID-19 was starting to peak its rear head, ugly head here in California. So we set up a command center around February 28th. Uh, we went and uh, looked at our own facilities where we can set up um, extra beds. We went with the local fire chief to see how we can expand outside the hospital property. We went to um, a local um, gym site, uh, we, which had a huge amount of space where we could have set up 800 beds. We looked at the local um, uh, college 
uh, which also became the alternative care site um, when we opened up um, and make sure that whatever we couldn't handle could be overflown to, or could be sent to over to this ACS. So then in March 7th, we admitted our first COVID case. It was interesting. It was actually a couple, a husband and a wife who had traveled out of the country um, and then went to Florida and then came back home. And uh, so that was the, the start. And we had a very, very astute ER doc who thought maybe I should just test for COVID. And sure enough, it was. Um, so we decided in order to, you know, being in El Centro, we are limited in our resources, um, whether it's uh, beds, whether it's staff, whether it's doctors, um, uh, health, you know, any kind of uh, post acute centers, we have a lot of problems with not having enough resources. So we uh, used the social media to get attention and, and we did. Um, so as we started doing that, we also did our own executive and um, management huddles in the morning to start talking about what's going on in each department and how we can move together. Wave two, I, I put, I put, you know, um, I don't know because we, we went down a little bit, but not a whole lot. And so I don't ever felt like we got out of this at all. So, um, and we are continuing to climb today. We are at a, uh, we're a 161 bed licensed hospital. Ordinarily we have a census of usually in the winter time around 90, um, summer, you know, in the summertime around 70. Today we're at 158 and we have 113 COVID positive patients. So you can see what the challenges that we are experiencing. Next slide. So we, we started putting up policies and processes in place so we could um, have the communication to our staff, to the community and what to expect um, from our hospital. We obviously you know, wanted to get the, the message out, what are the symptoms? We set up greeters, what we call greeters, customer represent, represents, representatives um, at each of our entrances. And, and they would ask questions, take te temperatures of people who are entering our hospital. We did put a visitor policy in. And as, as Katie said, they're probably a little more um, open than we are. We pretty much shut a lot of things down in terms of visitors. Um, the usual customer, you know, whether you're having a baby, you could have a one partner. You have a child here. You have one mom or dad for the duration uh, that the patient is here. If you have a, a mentally ill patient or Alzheimer's patient, you have one visitor for the duration. Now, if the patient's here more than a week, then we will accept another transition person. So we were pretty restrictive. Uh, we sent out information about how we're going to use our N95s mask for healthcare workers. Uh, we are on a conservation program where we have a, a rotation of our masks and how we would store them. Um, also, how the COVID patients would be processed through the system. Every patient that gets admitted here is tested before they go on to the floor. So we know what we're dealing with uh, prior to placement uh, in a bed. So we, we don't um, create a problem in putting a non-COVID with a COVID patient. Next slide. So we, de we decided to look at uh, several categories and how we did our planning. We pretty much followed the WHO system through a pandemic and it's about what kind of space can we use to convert uh, to inpatient, uh, med surge um, and ICU and other areas. Just in critical care beds, we started with 12 beds. That was our, that was our number. We're at 32 critical care beds right now. Now we're not staffed to that because we, don't, we can't find all the staff, but we were able to create it. Now we just created another uh, eight beds for intermediate uh, use, which you never had before. Um, so we also had increased staff. We always had difficulty getting staff. We have a fair number of travelers all of the time. And so we had to really plan ahead. The first wave, it seemed easier as the country was experiencing in its regions so we were able to get a, quite a few travelers. Second wave, everybody is in the same boat. So we're having a lot of trouble having getting enough travelers. Um, we also got, and I will explain this a little later, is that we also got a lot of help from the state and the federal government. 
supplies. Obviously, everybody was focused on ventilators in the first wave, staffing, of course. Um, we, we didn't really have a lot of problems with drugs, um, getting drugs. Oxygen is, it was a problem in the first wave. We're able to solve that problem and it's become a bigger problem in the second wave, but we are still holding pretty well in that area. And all of the things that we needed to do from the system, uh, how, do we, how do we do the tracking? How do we respond to um, when we have to make a shift to a new area uh, of the hospital? Um, we built tents. We had an ER tent that triaged patients. Then we built a another tent uh, to triage them where we couldn't put the, we'd only had three isolation rooms in the ER. So we had to find a place where we isolate the patients um, when the ER was full. Then um, in the second wave, we had the um, EMSA, California EMSA team put in a 50 bed field hospital right on our property on how we were gonna staff that and how that would be managed and what kind of patients. Next slide. So here is some just the planning of the what was prior to the pandemic. Next slide. Then when we started expanding, you know, we went from uh, up to 167. But um, you know, so we were able to decide how we want to distribute our patients. Next slide. And then when we went into the surge, we uh, opened some more beds, and we haven't gotten the MOB conference rooms ready yet, but we because we did get the field hospital so right now we are filling up the field hospital right at this moment they're about it's a 50 bed right now we have about 14 patients in there so we uh and that's not all the patients we can transfer we're just trying to slowly move them in there next next slide so what do we do once the hospital and the field hospital is full we put some options together the uh the play park, the Martin Luther King Pavilion, we could put 75 beds there. Uh, obviously the office building where we put cots uh, has some additional beds. And then some other options that if we get even beyond that um, community center and um, we do use the alternative care site, but therefore lower acuity if I may, patients that are, are not quite ready to be discharged but not as uh, sick uh, that they need to stay in a hospital of this acute level, but still need to be cared for or don't have a place to be quarantined. So uh, next slide. So we did a lot of planning, um, especially with the uh, first uh, wave, trying to make sure we had everything ready because we had to get a lot of stuff from um, the state and the state was kind enough to uh, give us a lot of equipment and some supplies. Next slide. And then how do we look at our hospital? We redeployed some employees. We did close down the OR in the first wave um, and redeployed surgical techs, RNs. We kept the PACU open for overflow from the ER and also was a secondary ICU temporarily. Um, we obviously had to put the budget together to make sure what we expected, what we got from the federal support to help us um, to get uh, this space and uh, staff and equipment that wasn't available through the state. And then how do we apply all of these people and this equipment? And so we had to do a lot of education and uh, use the, the skill sets of people that had the education to apply it to other people that could help who are rede redeployed. Next slide. Um, so there were three things that the state had put together. They had um, county by county, we all had to look at our surge plan well, for scarce resources. In the first wave, we were very concerned on, on ventilators and how do we, if we get to the point that we had to make a decision who gets a ventilator, very emotional decision, very difficult decision but what can we do with some objective data? We use some tools, some tools called the AMSOFA, modified SOFA tool, the Charleston tool, which are um, evidence-based tools to look at the uh, triggers that might help us make a decision from our triage team, who gets a ventilator if we have to get to that. Um, so what we did is we, we divided up the planning through what do we do now when we're a little busy, and, but we have to 
you know, we have to manage some things some of our resources. So what was the trigger from conventional to contingency where, yes, we're going beyond our usual busy time. And now we have to think of new space, new, more staff. And then, um, then what did we do when we really got into the crisis where we are right now? So the next slide is show you um, that this was how we considered the conventional surge capacity is a busy day. We're doing what we usually do with a little bit more staff. Uh, we're holding staff over the shift or people coming in with more hours. Uh, we brought in ventilators um, from extra floors and um, we did do some hallway treatments and, and keeping patients in the hallway. Then we went into contingency Next slide. And this contingency was relying on the space. So as I said, we, we created some new spaces. We uh, enlarged the capacity of our ICU. We put in a tent, um, which helped us open our, our space. And then trying just to, what do we do with, um, with nurses that really may not have had all of the training is that we did just in time training. Our education force came in and helped um, our uh, nurses find out, you know, how do I ha handle a high flow patient, that patient is on high flow um, type of respiratory support. Um, we did not have to uh, go beyond our ratio very much in the first wave. Definitely in the second wave, we have gone to seven to one in the med surge. Um, we also are providing what we call nurse extenders. And these could be uh, just another CNA, it could be an MA, it could be an EMT, a paramedic, um, another, an LVN. We were not, um, we did not have LVNs in the hospital. We have now bringing in LVNs, MAs, paramedics to help us. So people expanding their role uh, to be an extender to help nurses, you know, maintain that seven to one ratio. Uh, they're still coming in because our patients are growing and increasing. So it's, it's been a challenge just to get those types of extenders in. We also even open it up to our students in, in the healthcare programs in our local technical college. So students that have been enrolled, that are enrolled, actively enrolled and going to school for RN, LVN, MA, all of those categories are also invited to be extenders. So we've tried a whole different kinds of strategies and hopefully um, that'll get us through the, th this uh, pandemic. And of course, always, you know, looking at our supplies, we are in very good shape with, with PPE, but uh, we always try to keep a stockpile um, where we're seeing some shortages of time to time, you know, we try to find another source for it. And uh, usually we have not gotten to any point where we've run out of anything. Next slide. Um, we, we take a look at, um, as I said, we're putting this plan together. It's an active plan and how we're going to, you know, take a look at uh, scarce resources and staffing is one of them. And we just got the, what we call the DMAT team. They're a federal team that came in just this weekend uh, to help us with our overflow of patients. And they'll be here to the 24th of December. They're here for about 11 days. I don't know what I'm going to do after that. I'm hoping I get another DMAT, CalMAT, National Guard, whatever, uh, to help us um, support our hospital. So that's one of the things that we're really uh, strategizing every day and working with the state. Next slide. You can go to the next slide. So one of the things that when the first wave that we were found out is that we were dealing with not just the community of El Centro or Imperial County. We were also dealing with our, our border town, Mexicali, which has 2 million plus people. There are many expats in um, the Mexicali and in, that also utilizes um, US you know, type of hospitals. So since we're only the, fir we're the first hospital over the border from uh, Mexicali. So we were finding that many of the Americans were coming over the border to seek uh, healthcare in US and that we were becoming very much um, uh, impacted by that. Um, so that was our first wave. Not so much this time. I think the Mexican hospitals are re-strategized and also are able to handle it a little bit better in the second wave. Now it's just community-based. So whatever we're seeing, it's, it's spreading through the community to each family. We're multi-generational homes. 
of you know parties and, and events that are uh, where have high um, attendance of people are usually what we're finding are, are the source of the spread of COVID. And we also have an influx of, of, of uh, the US uh, Canada, uh, Canadians here to the US and they tend to stay here in the winter time because it's uh, a little bit warmer than Canada and, um, and it's very pleasant here during that time. So we had to deal with all these extra people. Uh, I think people are staying home now, people are not traveling, so we're not seeing the Canadians as much as we were seeing it in the first wave. Next slide. So the thing about it is, is that we're all looking at this, this peak and this flattening of the curve. And it seems like we're, when we hit our peak that we've kind of missed, you know, we always see it after the fact, you know, and so you're always planning, you know, probably coming two steps behind. And so they often can't tell you where you are until you're there or past it. And then, you know, when the peak was not such a single curve, it could be a sum of many curves. And that's what we experience as well. So um, now we're learning from our first uh, peak, but there was more to learn on our second peak. We thought we had it, we got it down, but you know, now the second peak has, has served us different challenges. Next slide. So when you look at the top um, table, that was back in May. And so when you look at Imperial County and you look at the numbers, um, it, I mean, our numbers seem small, but when you look at the numbers per 100K, we were the highest number per population um, in, in the number of cases that were being seen here in, in Imperial County. So you can see how we, we were impacted. Um, you know, small numbers can have a big impact in small towns. And then we looked at it again in November, end of November. Again, seeing the 100 per K, we we're impacted even more uh, in the second wave. So you can see where our challenges are. Next slide. So uh, in the first wave, El Centro um, had the highest uh, cumulative case. We were number one in uh, first wave. We've dropped to number 13 uh, in the second wave, but I, I, my guess is because the whole country is now experiencing it, places like North Dakota didn't have much in the first wave, and now they're experiencing the impact of COVID there. Next slide. And so when we started looking at our COVID numbers and tracing, or tracking the numbers um, back in April, well, we, as you we saw is in March when we started seeing our first patient and then, then oh boy, then it started creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. And so the CEO, Dr. Edward and myself said, we, we got to set up the command center and we had set up the command center and now we have, a, we have to execute the plan. And so you can see how our numbers climbed and we, I think we saw the, the flattening a little bit when it came to the end of August. It felt like it for a moment. It really did only now that we're in the thick of things again. Next slide. This is a very busy slide. So when you see the orange line uh, on this slide, that's our COVID numbers, COVID positive. And you can see the, 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 the peak and then we went down a little bit and we started going up again. Now this is uh, end of November. So you can see, uh, as I said today, we're at 158 uh, patients in our house and 113 or 112 COVID positive. And our census is much higher than it has ever been as you look at the gray line on the top line, how our census compared to the blue line has really significantly grow, grown. Next slide. So um, we follow this Imperial College model and it's a pretty accurate comparatively um, to other models and how we knew how to plan for it ahead of time. So uh, we, we knew that three weeks ago, um, we shut down the elective surgery because we saw the model showing us that we are going to be in 100 COVID patients in, in the short time. So we uh, stopped the elective surgery, just do urgents and emergencies. And we've deployed those, that staff to help us in the other parts of the hospital. Next, uh, next slide. So there was, a, there was a need for help. We asked for help. And so next slide, we got several teams. Our first team was um, a, a DMAT team that came. There were about, uh, there were several physicians, several nurses that came to help us. They were the first team that was activated in April. Next slide. Then there was the, next slide was that we had the, um, the health corps. Uh, these are primarily nurses 
and um, and and some of these nurses were nurses that were furloughed from other hospitals. Some and the most of them that were furloughed was pretty new nurses um, that had very little experience. So we really had to use them in another way because they they didn't have enough experience to uh, carry out a whole team. So we we really appreciated it and but we also uh, continue to um, be challenged with enough qualified staff. Next slide. Our third team uh, was the, the, the movement to our via uh, the ground ambulances EMT crew. We used those ambulances and increased our ambulance force uh, so we can get uh, our patients out of here through uh, what they call the, the uh, transfer center. And uh, this access uh, transfer center started up a little shaky trying to get patients out of here because our strategy is if we can get the patients out of here, we can continue to you know, uh, handle all the patients that came into our hospital. And so they went to different parts of the, the state. Um, and we finally, they finally got, you know, we got, a, we got a humming out of that and we were able to do it pretty well in the first wave. The second wave, because the whole state is, is in the same predicament, no beds are available or very few beds are available. So we're kind of at a standstill right now in all parts of California, not only in the Centro, but because we're a small hospital, we don't have a whole lot of bandwidth. Um, we, uh, the transfer center is finding it very challenging to send patients elsewhere. Next team was the fourth team was um, the going more by air, reach and mercy our helicopter, and plan fixed wing um, services. And we're trying to get patients out. Our challenge there was what kind of ventilatory device were they on? An event was easier than on a high flow BiPAP, trying to put, put patients in there and go to San Diego, not a problem, but going to LA, San Francisco was a problem because of the oxygen um, consumption was really high and not being able to get to those places without running out of oxygen. And we, we had quite a few um, transfers. We, we were able to transfer well over 650 patients. Uh, for us, that's quite a few transfers and, and to find places to put them. Now, um, like I said, we're at a pretty much of a standstill trying to find places. Let, and one of the other place, uh, problems in the first wave where they weren't accepting um, uh, patients, uh, COVID patients back in their residency in LTAX or SNFs. Uh, there's a little more leniency there now, but uh, still challenging because we don't have LTAX here in, in El Centro. Next slide. Uh, then they, well, we, we asked for the field house in the first wave. We, we had a lot of discussion with a lot of people. Didn't happen in the first wave, but definitely happened here. Uh, so we do have the uh, field hospital up and running and staffed by the DMAT team that came uh, this week, this last week. Next. So um, the sixth team is the, um, as Katie re uh, talked about, we were able to get the intensivists from UCSD. They helped us in our ICU, our pulmonary um, uh, needs uh, to make sure that patients were being well managed on the vents, as well as if we needed a patient to go further than what they could be managed on a vent, they went to um, for ECMO services to UCSD. So um, that was the, the really a, a turning, turning point for our uh, patients in the ICU. Next slide. And our 17th is the National Guard came in with a top-notch group of nurses and physicians and helped us uh, in the ED and the ICU with several codes a day. Uh, several lines to be put in. The ED staff were, are the usual people that go to these codes and respiratory um, arrest type of uh, situation um, where this added staff really helped the ED so they could stay in the ED and take care of the patients there and the staff could take the patients on the floor. Next one is and then the most important, you know, um, all of these people from this, the state helped us find um, help and we're very appreciative to all of these um, great people from EMSA, from uh, Public Health, from CHA, um, all of the uh, political people in our, in our state really uh, extended themselves and helped us a lot. Next slide. 
Hey, Lou, yeah. we have just a couple of minutes uh, left. We wanted to leave some time for um, questions. There's still okay, so let, slides let, let, left. All right, thank you. I'll just get right down to a couple more slides over. And then there's our, our main team, that's our Alpha Hospital. Next slide. Um, I just want to talk to you, as Katie alluded to, we also, for Little Hospital, we're very fortunate to have all of these treatment options for our hospital, which is not usual in a small hospital, but we were able to do all of these things as well. And let me just go to the, the very last part of it, this, if you will, I just want to talk about mental health, uh, which is what we really, people are being stressed or tired, um, so we put a mental health keep going, uh, mental health program together. And that mental health program has, um, in, we have what we call a quiet room where people can go and sit and there's quiet music, Zen music, there's essential oils, there's a little uh, organic food there and some water. And that's how we were trying to help have mental for our mental wellness for our hospital. So that's a lot of uh, a lot of great information. Um, we've got some questions in the chat box uh, and some that have been texted to me. Lou, you mentioned uh, the seven to one uh, ratio. That's for med surge, I'm assuming, and that's amazing that you are the model for that. We're still trying to get some of the, you know, that team nursing concept going here. There's a little bit, I think, of uh, you know, it's, it's new, and you know, is that what's that going to look like? But uh, clearly, uh, your patients are doing well with that. So I'd be uh, that's something we're going to be meeting on today, actually, about team nursing so that we can open up more capacity. How about the ICU? What's your, what have you been able to do with the team nursing in the ICUs? We were given permission to go to three to one. We haven't done it yet because I, I need the extenders there first um, before we go to three to one, but that's our plan. Okay. So 71. Wow, that's amazing on the, the med surge units. Um, Katie, have you started doing any team nursing at your place? We haven't quite yet. Um, we're definitely in talks about it. Um, I haven't heard anything about our ratio changing, but what essentially happened, like I briefly touched on, is that our volunteer network, so mostly, for example, like our PACU nurses who do have previous ICU experience would start taking ICU level patients, um, anyone with previous ICU experience. And then in addition, we've also been training some of our volunteer nurses from other levels of care that are interested in taking courses on ventilation and things like that. So we have started training them a little bit. Um, and the plan would be that we in the ICU would mentor them as they take care of critically ill patients if it gets to that point. Yeah, you know, the, the problem is every time we say we need ICU nurses, their, their answer is always, well, shut down ambulatory cases. And I think we all know um, that shutting down ambulatory cases, we did this the first time, and we actually put people at risk. We missed cancers. We, we missed all kinds of things. We had a, a patient who didn't have his cataract surgery, and he was the only, he was 80 some year olds, you know, couldn't drive, and his vision got worse. So we actually did damage to people by doing that blanket. So our ask as a group is, please don't do that. Um, you know, no, we, no, we, we agree wholeheartedly shutting everything down. Isn't necessarily the answer. We were just, we needed some time to figure things out in the beginning. And I think that was one of the biggest lessons learned right away. Hey, people still need basic care just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean everything else gets ignored. I'm glad to hear you say that as a frontline. It makes us feel better that we're asking for the for the right things. Yeah. Um, Jeff, you you've had a different population. We heard you know a lot about the inpatient side, but you know they clearly you mentioned some about the employees. What are you doing uh, for basically to to meet some of these challenges with, with burnout? Uh, that is a huge issue. You touched upon it, but specifically, what are you doing uh, for your staff? Uh, well, a number of things. Uh, one is. Uh, continue messages from this, our CEO, Fran Butler Cohen, to the staff on a weekly basis, providing support, guidance, education, you know, and then going above and beyond. So we've, we've had actually food distribution for our staff that are, um, again, food insecure because of the low, lower uh, pay. Uh, we've had, against childcare, I mentioned that. Um, we've had one of our providers do a weekly uh, mental health check-in support group for any provider that wants to um, be a part of that Zoom call. Um, and um, I think it's, it's something always we're talking with our managers and what you can do individually. Now we're going into the Christmas season. So how do we provide support uh, with our staff during the Christmas season? And that, that's something actually I'm gonna be talking with my staff later today because you can't have a Christmas party. That's not, and so what else can you do in lieu of that to really show the staff you care um, you're supporting them and, and you know it, they're 
they're trying their best, but these are difficult times. So it's it's a it's a lot of different avenues. There's really no magic bullet. Yeah, you know, the Christmas thing, our, our IS folks, believe it or not, were very creative around Thanksgiving. They actually had a Zoom meeting where people showed their favorite recipes and what they what the product was. So, you know, we had the CIO showing about his, his sweet potato pie, and then we had someone with a chef's hat on. It was, actually, it was actually a lot of fun, and they shared the recipes later. So people are being very, very creative. I love, Lou, your Zen room idea. Um, you know, we, we had done that all before, the code purple or whatever that we used to call that, but probably need to revisit. And then the big question of the day uh, for all of you is vaccines. Uh, in, you know, Jeff, you know, you, some of your folks will be getting the vaccine tier two, right, because they're ambulatory. But, you know, the rollout and, you know, how do you think that's going to affect you? Uh, that was one of the questions on the chat box. So, Katie, um, starting with you, because you're like basically second line up. Yeah. Um, so as far as I know, UCSD emergency department staff is kind of first line and then uh, ICU staff will be second line. So um, this was just announced. We're going to get some more information on what on Wednesday from the hospital. Um, I'm really eager to speak with some of my colleagues about it, what they're feeling. Um, you know, it's it's mixed emotions, to be honest. Um, on one hand, we are feeling very hopeful that relief is on the way. We're feeling very hopeful from the data that's already out on the vaccine that this is going to work. Um, but there are naturally still other questions. You know, this is it was a short trial compared to others and it's a new technology. And so there's some hesitation and some question. Um, you know, surprisingly, I will admit we uh, as frontline nurses, again, kind of like I talked about with our testing and our PPE, we're feeling a little bit safer. So we're eager for it to really get rolled out to the high risk population. We're, we're eager for that phase because then that's when we're gonna start feeling a little bit of relief on the front lines. Um, we feel safe right now with our PPE. Um, and so we're, again, just, yeah, really eager to get to that phase where we can start feeling that relief. Now, the concern is, uh, you all know about the a AFL that came out telling us to test all of our healthcare workers on the front line every week. Uh, UCSD is lucky. I mean, you have a huge, uh, you know, testing capability because all the students, the rest of us don't have that testing capability. And so we we do have to focus, and I know Lou's working with this as well, uh, with, with um, Imperial County high risk, you know, the people are actually symptomatic. We know PPE works. I know there's a worried well on the staff, but we know the PPE works. So just a word to the rest of you. We know you, we hear that every day. UCSD is doing it. Okay, but you guys have a different test that we do. Priority is still going to be symptomatic patients. And, and truly, if there's an outbreak area, then we want to test those in asymptomatic staff first before we can do the routine screening. So just a word, word I, I heard you mention that. I think that's great that you have that capability, but just for the rest of us, we do have tiers. Um, Jeff, anything about the vaccines? Uh, and then we'll- uh, oh, I, 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 You probably have all heard, you know, there's 20,275 doses uh, that are coming in either today or early this week. Uh, and then we found out from the county that there's another, the second, supply that dose because it's going to be the Pfizer vaccine and there's, so there's you know it's two doses the state has it on reserve um, so obviously the 28,000 is going to go very quickly um, the county said um, healthcare worker in this instance the first tier is going to be those that work in a hospital um, and within that it's those that actually would frequent an acute care unit or the emergency room um, is my understanding uh, so that would likely include um, others that support those um, those efforts on the unit. So we're not in, obviously in that first tier. Um, we're um, tier two. Uh, we're looking at probably mid to late January, I think, before our, our, our frontline staff start getting vaccinated. And so, um, you know, in the interim, we're just, again, um, PPE and, and um, social distancing and everything else that works to prevent individuals from getting COVID. Yeah, we're worried about, um, uh, Christmas coming and a repeat of Thanksgiving. Um, as much as you emphasize with staff not to have family gatherings, it's very hard to do that over Christmas. And so that's probably, it is our big worry on the horizon is dealing with the current surge. And then is there another surge coming after Christmas too? Yeah, I just heard that 10 of our hospitals are on a by bypass right now. So when everybody's on bypass, that means nobody is on bypass. So uh, it's evolving as we go. So within the last minute we have, Lou, one word of advice to people as we head into the next surge, what would be your advice? I think it's the, the what we've always been saying, wash your hands, wear a mask properly, and keep your distance. Yeah, 
Katie, any words of, of uh, inspiration as we head into this next, uh, next huge peak? You know, find what works for you to keep yourself happy, whether it's reading a book, meditation, find something simple that you can enjoy to take care of yourself, cherish your loved ones, make time for Zoom calls and, and FaceTime and, and just connect with your loved ones during this really difficult time. That's a good reminder. Be present. It's so easy to have your mind so preoccupied that I always say it's quality, not quantity. Even if it's 15 minutes, be there for that 15 minutes. That's a great reminder. And Jeff, you're getting a puppy. So that's a great, uh, <laughs> but not everybody can get a puppy. So what's your general advice for everybody? Yeah, there was, uh, I was on an ACHE uh, call uh, because education session earlier in uh, November and, and one of the um, hospital systems in Florida asked their patients, uh, what, what in their life gives them a sense of joy, which is particularly important during a pandemic. And so, you know, it's, fa it's family or, or kids um, or a puppy or exercising or just getting out and, and uh, going for a drive or going into nature and going for a hike. I think all those things are more important <laughs> than ever during these um, just um, endless days of the pandemic. So I encourage everyone to really find out your source of joy and pursue it, uh, particularly during the holidays. Yeah, great reminders. All right, we're just one minute over. Those are great presentations, inspiring for me as well. I hand it back to Stacy. Thank you so much. On behalf of the National Office of ACHE, I want to thank our chapter leaders that planned today's session, the moderator and panelists, and of course, all of you for your participation. Please complete the course evaluation by visiting your My ACHE page and selecting My Online Learning. From there, click on the Access My Courses link and you'll be directed to our learning management system where you can complete the evaluation. In the same location, you'll be able to access the recording of this session within 48 hours. Your face-to-face -face credits will be posted to your account approximately two weeks following the session. That concludes our session for today, which is copyrighted in 2020 by the American College of Healthcare Executives, all rights reserved. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Jeff, Katie. Um, really, you guys did a, a great job in lieu, of course. So everybody have a great day. Stay safe, wear your masks. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.